I gotta go learn this. Now I gotta go online and see the class. Go online. Yeah, I missed this one. Too. Good morning, everyone. We are on page 62. We will repeat number 10. I apologize. Chapter 12 The laws pertaining to the preparation of one's body for prayer and the places where it is fit to pray. Seif, uh, paragraph 10. A person should designate one synagogue or house of study where he will pray regularly. We are dealing with a place where there are many kosher synagogues who obey and follow Jewish law, where there is a choice. You pick one that you go regularly. Not in the distant, not the closest, not the farthest, but the one you feel most comfortable and able to have kavana, to have concentration when you pray. Similarly, or if they offer good cholent, it depends, <laughs> each one based on his preferences. <laughs> Sushi. Similarly, within the synagogue, once you pick a synagogue, he should designate a fixed place to pray. Within four cubits of a place is still considered as the same place. As long as it's within six, uh, six feet around, if someone is taking your place, you can move around mm -hmm. one seat, two seats, that's okay. But we need to designate a spot for each other. That's why in the uh, traditional synagogues, they have a nameplate or they have a sticker in Israel, not just because they want to make money that you buy the seat, it's because we want to make sure everybody knows that's your spot. It is preferable if we can find a fixed place near a wall, as we find in the case of Ezekiah, Hizkiah in Isaiah, that relates that when he decided to pray to God, his Hizkiah turned his face to the wall. So near a wall or a separation between the next person is the appropriate place to, play, to pray. One should not stand or sit next to a wicked person doing prayer. When a person prays at home, he should also establish a fixed place so that the members of his household will not disturb him. So if you don't go to synagogue and you pray in the morning, you put on filling or you pray, make sure you have the designated spot. That's where you're going to be praying every time you pray. Yes? It's being judgmental. I don't know if that person did it or not. Ask the rabbi. Number 11. <laughs> it, is a mitzvah, it is a mitzvah to run to the synagogue, not walk, but run to the house of study or to fulfill other mitzvot. You run to the mikveh, you run to the synagogue, you run to help somebody. As Hosea states, let us run to know God. And Psalm states, I will run on the path of your mitzvot. Accordingly, even on Shabbat, it is permitted to run for the sake of mitzvah because it is forbidden. Generally, it is forbidden to run on Shabbat. It's exercise. and exercise is forbidden on Shabbat. However, going to synagogue and one runs, it's, a prop it's okay. However, within a synagogue or house of study, it is forbidden to run because it's disrespectful for, for the synagogue. So you run to shul, you get out of the car in the parking lot, you go fast to the synagogue. Once you has, enter the house of prayer, the room where you pray, you must go with respect, walk with respect. When a person approaches the entrance to the synagogue, he should hesitate momentarily so that he does not enter suddenly because entering just quickly is a, disrespect, uh, a show of disrespect. He should tremble and fear from the splendor of his glory, blessed be his name. He should recite the verse of Psalm, and I, through your great kindness, enter your house. We say it in the morning, in Matov, every, every morning, which is comparable to receiving permission, as if he is asking permission from God to enter his house, his palace. Afterwards, he should enter and proceed with awe and fear, as if he is walking in the presence of a king. In communities where Jews have streets of their own, it is a mitzvah to wrap oneself in the talis and put on tefillin at home and walk to the synagogue wearing them in those places where the Jews live among the Gentiles or one who would have to pass an alleyway that are filled with filth. One should wrap in oneself if in the talis and put on tefillin in the enter room before the synagogue itself. For entering the synagogue wearing a talis and crowned with a tefillin is a great matter. And that's why in our synagogue, most people put on tefillin over here and then they walk into synagogue. Because you want to enter the synagogue while putting, I don't do it because I can't, I have to run here and be here early. But the Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, would put on his talis and tefillin in his room 
and then walk to synagogue while he, wrapped in talis and tefillin, not putting him on while you sit it on your spot. So it is the right thing to do to do it in the social, so to say, in the social room before you enter the synagogue. Number twelve. Should something prevent one from going to a synagogue or a house of study or attending any other fixed minion, one like a shiva minion or they call in for a minion in a place, one should try to assemble ten people to pray together with a minion at home. If that is impossible, one should at least pray at the time the minion prays. For this is a proposed, pro, 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 propitious. propitious pray at the time the people of the nearest city, city pray communally. So if I don't pray in a minion and there is a minion in town, it's appropriate to pray at the same exact time so that our prayers go up together. Nevertheless, a person who must study Torah or begin work, which is very pressing, may begin prayer early even if there is no minion as soon as the sun rises. Why? Since, as explained in chapter 8, a person may not involve himself in these activities before prayer. So you can go to walk and then pray. You can't eat before you pray. Therefore, pray earlier and then do what activities you're involved with. 13. Similarly, <coughs> a person who feels weak and has difficulties w waiting to eat until after the minion completes its prayers is permitted to pray earlier at home in order to eat immediately after, and all of us, okay, we'll continue. So if you need to eat breakfast early in the morning, and waiting until after prayer will weaken the person or cause the person to be sick or not be able to function during the day, you should pray much earlier. In Chabad communities, as probably we'll get to it later, what we do is we say Birkot HaShachar, the first morning blessing from 5 to uh, page 11, I believe. We say the Shema, and some will put on talis and fill in and say the Shema, and then they are able to eat, and then they go to synagogue. And so if you must eat, uh, with the, he's talking about a full complete meal with washing hands, you must, you should pray first. Similarly, I'm sorry, uh, nevertheless, a, I'm sorry, a person is permitted to pray earlier only when he remains at home. However, if he comes to a synagogue where a minion prays communally, he may not pray before the minion. It is also forbidden to leave the synagogue in order to pray before the minion. Nevertheless, should he see that the minion is delaying its prayer, he may, be, he may pray alone in order that the time of Shmon Esra not pass before he prays. Similarly, if he is sick or there are other factors beyond his control, he has to catch a plane or a train, it is permissible to pray earlier than the minion this applies even in the synagogue. However, it is preferable for him to go home to pray. It's if he knows that he has to pray much earlier than the minion, okay. instead of praying in synagogue and everybody watching him leaving before the minion begin or doing the minion, he should pray at home first. <coughs> Number 14. There are opinions which maintain that if one minion has already prayed in the synagogue and a second minion also came to pray there, the chazan from the second minion is forbidden to stand in the same place of the chazan from the first minion. For this is disrespectful to the first minion. This applies only if the members of the first minion have not yet left the synagogue. So there are some who say if you do a second minion, don't do it in the same spot while the first minion is still there. Similarly, if the first minion took out a Torah scroll to read from, the second minion should not take out a Torah scroll to read in the same synagogue, but move to another spot. Nevertheless, in many communities, no attention is paid to these matters. In practice, everything follows the custom of the community. And I can tell you that where I grew up in Kfar Chabad or in Brooklyn by the Rebbe's synagogue, there are minions like a major train station constantly. Uh, as long as wow. one minion is already over, we can do the second minion. Ali, start walking on the second one. <laughs> Fifteen. <laughs> The inhabitants of a city may enforce rules intended to motivate one another to build a synagogue or a house of study and to purchase sacred texts to study. So they can come into an individual and say, this is a rule, everybody must participate. Similarly, in a place where there is no regular minion, the community members may employ fines to compel one another to attend the minion regularly. <laughs> So oh, that the daily, that. so that <laughs> the daily service will not be nullified, even if attendance at the minion 
will cause the scholars to cancel their study, <coughs> they should be compelled to attend the minion. The time designated for Torah is one matter, and the time for prayer another. And therefore, if a minion is missing, even the scholars who study Torah in yeshiva or they teach Torah, they have to stop to attend the minion so there is a minion. If you have two minions going on and there's one missing from the second minion, can somebody from the first minion attend the second question? minion? Yes, as long as there are six who did not pray. I so think we studied person, in loads of prayer. Person. You must have a minion is kosher. And Harry, you have to know that because sometimes you continue bohu and there are no six who are holding with the chazan and prayer and it is in, inappropriate to pray. For example, most people showed up later or some people who don't pray are attending. I'm not always holding by bohu. You need to have six who follow you when you say the Kaddish of the Rishtaba. I will, not a problem. Have back in, have back in oh, Chapter 13. We have another five minutes. Chapter 13. The laws pertaining to the sanctity of a synagogue and a house of study and a Beit Medrash. Number one. The sanctity of a synagogue or a house of study is very great. We are warned to be in awe of the one who rests within them. God, blessed be his name. As... Leviticus states, fear my sanctuaries. This applies to a synagogue and a house of study, for they are also called sanctuaries. As Ezekiel states, I will be small sanctuary for them. And Megillah, Talmud Megillah interprets, the, the, these are the synagogues and house of, <coughs> of study. So a sanctuary today, at the time of Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple was a sanctuary, or the Mishkan, the Tabernacle. Today, a sanctuary is a place where we study Torah or a place where we pray, which is a synagogue. Accordingly, it is forbidden to engage in idle talk or to reckon accounts inside them. The latter does not apply to accounts associated with the mitzvah, for example, that of the charitable fund and the like. These buildings should be treated with respect and swept and mopped. Candles are lit in them to show them honor. So we're not allowed to do idle talk, we're not allowed to do accounting there to finances unless it is for a mitzvah, to help someone, uh, support someone, to pay for the needs of the synagogue. These are, these are mitzvah needs, so we're allowed to do. We need to have great light and beauty in the synagogue to show honor, to show that we care about the place. One should not kiss one's small children inside these buildings. If it's your children, someone else's, or grandchildren, we're not allowed to kiss others in the synagogue. Why? in these places. It is not fitting to show any love other than the love of God, blessed be his name. Therefore, we don't kiss each other during uh, in the synagogue. Two, before one enters them, one should clean the mud off at one's feet and check that there is no dirt on one's person or on one's clothes. You enter to a clean place, make sure your shoes are clean, make sure your, your, body, your clothes are clean. It is permitted to spit inside However, one should immediately rub out the spittle with one's foot. When if I need to spit some, in those days they needed to spit. Sometimes they had a uh, um, we chewing tobacco, whatever or chewing tobacco. <laughs> but you must cover it, uh, scrub it with your foot, with your shoes. Okay. Number one, on the Shabbat. The note, the note says, on Shabbat, it is forbidden to rub out the spittle. However, one should pass one's foot over it. So if you spit on Shabbos, you have to put your foot over, not allowed to, to wipe it, because that's memachek, that is a forbidden walk on Shabbat. Number three, one should not enter them in the heat, only to seek refuge from the heat. Or in the rain, only to seek refuge from the rain. You're not allowed to use the synagogue for your own benefit. It's too hot and sunny. You need to take a break. Or you need to cool yourself down. Or you need to protect yourself from the rain, so you enter. We're talking about those days there were no cars, and they're walking in the street and got too hot. Not allowed to enter the synagogue for that purpose. Uh, if one has entered to call a colleague, somebody is in synagogue, he does not have his cell phone with him, and I want to call him, or his wife sent me to call him, one should enter, recite a verse, a Mishnah, or a prayer, or listen to others studying. At the very least, he should sit for a while, for sitting in this building is also a mitzvah, and then call his colleague. In other words, he, did a, he entered to perform a mitzvah, not just to call somebody. 
So if you enter a synagogue, if you I see it all the time in, in, in large communities, they're looking for somebody, they're meeting somebody, they made up to meet somewhere. They walk in synagogue, the first thing they do, they sit down. Even just sitting in a synagogue alone is a mitzvah. If they recite a verse from the Torah or start, uh, recite a psalm, they do another mitzvah. And then they can do whatever they need to do. Number four, it is forbidden to eat, drink, or sleep, even a short nap inside these buildings for the sake of a mitzvah, for example, on Yom Kippur night, one may sleep in them. If you, somebody sleeps for the sake of a mitzvah on Yom Kippur, he don't want to go home, he wants to stay here so he's holy, uh, he's allowed to sleep in a synagogue. However, one should move away from the holy ark. Similarly, it is permitted to eat there for the sake of a mitzvah, as long as no drunkenness or lightheadedness is involved. People who study there on a regular basis may eat and sleep there even for extended periods so that they will not neglect their studies because going home to eat and coming yeah, back she, takes time. This way they... Please. By the way, when we talk about synagogue in this community, that's why it's not a synagogue, it's a Chabad center because it's all encompassing many other functions. So the, what we deal with in here applies only to this room. And those who remember many years ago, it used to be a mechitza here. It used to be a separation, a divider, a movable divider. And I did it just for the purpose of separating between a sanctuary and a social hall. That they, it, it, they become very impractical, and also it became very dangerous. Children used to push them, and it, it was dangerous for them to fall, the, the, for the pieces to fall over. So we had to remove them. But this is a social hall. This is the sanctuary. This is the room that we're doing. Number five. When constructing a synagogue, it is necessary to consult a Torah sage who will give directions how it should be built. It's very important. People don't realize there are many, many way, many, many requirements in building a synagogue, and a scholar should be involved. Just don't get just the best architect, but get the rabbi as well. We'll conclude here and continue next week, chapter 14. <coughs>